Hello, everyone. Again, welcome to week number four. After you finish this week, you are officially halfway through this class. Um, so that's probably pretty exciting for everyone, getting this summer class halfway through, only another half to go. And we're fully in the swing of things. I think all of you have a pretty good feel for how the class operates, uh, and you're doing great work. So for that, uh, I commend all of you. Um, this week, we are going to shift out. Last week, we looked at the Age of Revolutions, where we're talking most specifically about political, but also social, uh, to an extent, revolutions that occurred across the Atlantic world from roughly 1775 uh, through the early 19th century. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about revolutions this week, because this week we're talking about the Industrial Revolution. Um, and though its name most easily associates the Industrial Revolution with an economic revolution, that is a transformation in economic processes of uh, production and distribution, the Industrial Revolution was arguably um, perhaps the most important transformation uh, of the social, political, and economic order uh, of the modern world. And so this week we're looking at um, the global Industrial Revolution because most often the Industrial Revolution is taught within a national context. That is, here's the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain or in France, what becomes Germany, Russia, the United States. Uh, perhaps you move outside of um, uh, the Industrial West and you talk about the Industrial Revolution in the Ottoman Empire or the Industrial Revolution in India or the Industrial Revolution in Latin and South America. We're going to talk about global processes. Um, this first lecture looks a little bit more specifically at Europe, uh, and the second lecture will shift uh, to more global processes. So you'll note that I only have two lectures this week. Yay! Uh, congratulations. You only have to listen to me for about 30 minutes this week. That's because there's also a documentary that I'm including available on YouTube, a link. I would suggest that you watch that documentary first. Uh, I'm noting this in my announcement, and uh, you can see here on this slide, uh, I recommend, I've got two questions for you to consider when you're watching the documentary, but if you haven't done that yet, stop here, come back to me, uh, watch our documentary first, because I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the origins of the Industrial Revolution. I will talk a little bit about um, its beginnings, but the documentary does a really good job in talking about what got the Industrial Revolution started in Great Britain uh, and what this looked like for people on the ground. So stop here and watch that uh, if you have not done so already. Instead, this lecture is going to look at what were the social and political effects, so not the origins, but the effects uh, of the Industrial Revolution. And like I note, I'm looking at both social and political uh, effects of the Industrial Revolution. So I don't want to rush through the end of this like I normally do, so I'm going to try to keep a pretty steady pace here. It's important to recognize um, what the Industrial Revolution replaced if we want to understand how revolutionary the Industrial Revolution was. And the dominant social, economic, and political system of uh, the European continent, especially prior to the Industrial Revolution, which began in Great Britain and spread first um, to both North America and also the continental uh, Europe mainland, um, the dominant political system in this European mainland that will eventually be dominated by Industrial Revolution was feudalism. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, familiar or perhaps interested with uh, the uh, Middle Ages, feudalism was this dominant social, political, and economic order. And basically, the and I'm going to boil it down and be really kind of, um, I guess, elementary about it. It's far more nuanced than we have time for. But basically, feudalism was uh, predicated on one simple um, fact. It was a fact of land ownership. In the feudal system, all land within a kingdom belonged to the king, or the queen in some instances. And this land was then kind of leased out um, to subjected people, whether they be lords who then leased that land out, to nobles who then leased that land out, uh, to peasants. And all of these vassals, right, these servants to the king, owed uh, the um, the people above them either crops, if you're the serfs, right, if you're the working class, you had to give part of your crops um, to a uh, nobleman who then provided knights, right, for the lord, who then provided this army for the king. And that's how uh, the political, social, and economic structure worked, right? It's social in that it keeps a hierarchy. It's political in that it maintains a kingdom, right, the king at the top of this. And it's economic in that the transfer of goods was largely up this, this hierarchy, right, from serfs 
straight up uh, through the king. And feudalism begins to wane in about the, you know, really in the 13th century, uh, you kind of have the height of feudalism, and it's going to start to wane 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. And, you know, scholars have talked about all sorts of different reasons for this. Uh, one that I'm going to kind of bring out to you is actually rather surprising. Sheep. Uh, yes, sheep may have been uh, responsible for the downfall of feudalism. And it's a bit more complicated than that. It's actually wool, not sheep themselves. Don't worry, there wasn't some sort of sheep revolution. Um, the price of wool is going to skyrocket in Europe as the population of Europe begins to increase, especially after the discovery of the colonies, which brought all sorts of new food from the New World, especially the potato uh, and maize, corn, uh, to uh, the Old World, which increased caloric intake, which meant that more people could survive uh, on, um, on, on these foodstuffs coming from the New World. So as more people uh, began to live longer as well, um, there was a population increase. More people need to be clothed. This really drove up the price of wool, uh, and it meant that more sheep uh, could produce more wool and then could produce more wealth. And in order to really have a productive uh, system of maintaining sheep, you needed to enclose your land. Right, and you can see in that top right picture there. Um, this is a uh, aerial view of the Europe of uh, the English countryside, actually. And you notice that all of this enclosed land um, was used uh, primarily during the late Middle Ages to graze sheep. The sheep were then sheared, and their wool was sold to the European continent, and this produced uh, a tremendous amount of wealth. But as land was enclosed, it drove more and more serfs. Right, these largely landless, they didn't own the land that was enclosed. So when the land became enclosed, they were kicked off of it. They could no longer farm. And so they moved to the cities, right? And this was the beginning, or in one argument, uh, the beginnings of modern capitalism. These serfs who could no longer uh, farm to provide for their uh, noblemen, then moved to cities where they had to take up some sort of skilled or unskilled labor within the cities. So they could be potters and things like that. Or they could work in these new upstart factories that were a part of um, uh, this in coming industrial revolution that the documentary talked a lot about. And this kind of selling of wage labor is the origin of capitalism. So what is capitalism exactly? To boil it down to its simplest terms, uh, I have a definition here. It's also called free market economy or free enterprise economy. It's an economic system, in, system dominant in mostly the Western world since the end of feudalism, in which the means of production, so that is how things are produced, are privately owned, and production is guided and income distributed largely through the operation of markets. So notice how different this is than the feudal system that came before it that was based on land ownership by the king. Uh, this form, capitalism, was based on private ownership of the means of production, which could be land, or it could be factories. So what are the effects of industrialization? Um, well, I listed five for you here. Uh, there's an increase in population throughout the European continent. There are growing urban centers. I've got a chart of the largest cities in 1341 in Europe, and you'll notice Paris was the largest. But by 1850, the largest city in Europe was actually London, which is really no surprise uh, because the Industrial Revolution really began in Great Britain, drove people out of the countryside into London. So London will be a, a city with over a million people in 1850. Uh, which is unprecedented for the time. Uh, there's also the creation of wage labor, which I just spoke a little bit about. Importantly, there's also the increasing uh, amount of wealth disparity. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And for these poor, there was very little, if any at all, mostly there was none, uh, social safety net. You know, things like social security, workers' comp, uh, these things didn't exist uh, in the 19th century. And so workers who fell on hard times, got sick or injured, were often left without any sort of a social safety net uh, to stop them from falling into destitute poverty. Uh, and the other thing that happens during the Industrial Revolution is emigration. Um, there was some emigration during the colonial period, but there's even more emigration during the 19th century. Um, the potato famine in Ireland will drive uh, landless Irish serfs and, and working class people uh, largely to uh, what is then the United States uh, and also Canada and Latin and South America. Uh, other emigrant groups will move uh, not not west to the New World, but actually east into Russia. And Russia sees a dramatic population boom uh, as Eastern Europeans uh, move even further east uh, into Russia. 
So what does Industrial Revolution look like? It looks like these images here, and you know, definitely check out my PowerPoint PDFs to really pause and look at what these factories and mines look like. The documentary takes you through a lot more of this factory life and this mine life, so I won't dive too much into it, but the Industrial Revolution was dirty. It was, it was crowded. Uh, there's, as you read in the textbook, there's um, epidemics that break out in overcrowded cities of things like cholera that can be traced back to contaminated wells with human feces. It's, you know, this really isn't pretty stuff. The other thing that's going to happen is that more and more workers are pushed out of agriculture and pushed into industry. Uh, and you can see from these charts here what industries, especially in, in Great Britain, were the most popular during the Industrial Revolution. You can also see the percentage of males who are working in uh, these industries. But it wasn't just men, right? It also meant women and children. Uh, women and children became large parts of the workforce for two reasons. One, uh, little hands, uh, especially children's hands, were perfect for the looms that were weaving uh, cotton clothing because they could fit between um, the strands of wool being pulled across uh, the loom. Uh, oftentimes this was quite dangerous too because as the shuttle came back it could take off little hands, which happened quite often. Uh, children were also ideal because they could fit into the narrow mine shafts that were mining coal. Women had traditionally been textile cloth producers, and so they had skilled background uh, in uh, working textiles, so they went to work into textile mills as well. But also, uh, entrepreneurs understood they could pay women and children less, and so this led uh, to women and children entering the workforce in large numbers. So what happens, right? Perhaps the most important social effect, right, is the creation of a new, entirely new, two, no, two new classes. One is the proletariat, and the second is the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie. Right, and this um, these classes were named kind of by Karl Marx. This is where um, we're going to get into Marxism a little bit. But the proletariat, they're the lowest, or, or one of the lowest, depending on where you are, uh, social economic classes. Um, they were workers who sold their labor. The majority of them were landless. Uh, most of them unskilled, right? Skilled workers, if you could work with iron or if you could work uh, with other uh, skilled processes, were a little bit better off than the normal proletariat. Um, they also were largely uneducated and they lived in these urban centers. Uh, you can see them depicted on the left. You know, this is where the poverty was. And the bourgeois class were these new middle class men. They were not titled nobility, right? And they're going to become increasingly more wealthy and more powerful throughout the 19th century. These men do not, for the most part, trace their uh, power or their wealth back to inherited money, right? These men were not titled nobility. It wasn't sir anything or, or knight anything. Um, instead, these were upstart middle class. And so this new bourgeois class, who's going to become increasingly powerful, is actually going to upend the upper echelons of European society, right? Those noblemen who had traced their lineage back hundreds of years become increasingly less powerful as the bourgeois class, this upstart middle class, the owners of the factories, become more and more profitable. So let's enter the scene someone who's going to really kind of pick apart this whole process, and that's Karl Marx. Karl Marx noted something. On the one hand, the Industrial Revolution had a lot of promise, right? It came up with a radical new idea that wealth was not fixed, right? Mercantilism operated on the idea that there was only a certain amount of wealth in the world. But capitalism argued, no, wealth could be created. Raw materials could be manufactured into finished materials that could create tremendous new wealth. And this meant that more and more people could, in theory, get their hands on this wealth. However, Marx noted that that's not what was happening. The bourgeois had no incentive to share their increasing wealth with the workers. In fact, they used the workers to compound their wealth gains, right? Think about it. In a factory, they paid a, a wage to a worker who then went home and spent his money on finished materials that that factory had produced. So he, the bourgeois created a secular cycle where they only increased their profits. You know, the payments they were making to workers only went back into their pockets. And so Karl Marx, you can read a little bit here about his background. Your primary source discussion has you discuss him. So you might want to read about his background here. Karl Marx was not uh, an economic theorist, he's a philosopher at heart, uh, but he noticed this kind of growing disparity between rich and poor, and it made him question how effective this new industrial capitalism was. And what spawns 
uh, the Communist Manifesto is that he witnesses a revolution in 1848 in Austria and in, in parts of southern Germany, or what become Germany. You can read a bit about it here when you look at the PDF. But he witnesses this revolution of working class people that's ultimately defeated. And so he asks himself why. Why was a revolution of so many people against so few defeated? And his ultimate argument is that the proletariat is divided. And we'll look a little bit more about what this divided proletariat means in the primary source and in the next lecture.